Good morning to you. I hope and trust that you're in a way in God's presence and blessing at this time. If you joined on Zoom earlier, then I suggest that you skip ahead to the hymn and then you'll be able to listen to Alan's prayer and the sermon. The notice is for the week. Tonight there won't be an English service, but there is a Welsh language carol service that will appear on YouTube from two o'clock this afternoon. And at five o'clock, there'll be a chance for the Welsh speakers to meet together on Zoom, an informal get-together at five o'clock. During the week, not many things, but we have the most important meeting of the week, seven o'clock, the prayer meeting, do come along to that if you can. And then next week, we're not sure about the morning yet. God willing, we'll have two services at 10 o'clock or 1130 or there might be one service like today at 10.30. So look out uh, for the emails about that. But there will be a Zoom meeting, probably followed by the YouTube service. In the afternoon, then, there'll be an English language carol service, and that'll appear on YouTube from 2 o'clock next Sunday. And at 5 o'clock, a chance for everyone to get together an informal time of fellowship on Zoom, 5 o'clock next Sunday. So those are the notices for the week. And now Kath is going to give a message to the children and that will be followed by our next hymn. Well, it's getting really close to Christmas now and I bet you're starting to feel a little bit excited. I'm really looking forward to the next three children's talks because they're all going to be about unexpected things that happen in the Christmas story. Now, I wonder if you know what the word unexpected means. It means that something happens that you didn't know was going to happen. Like that, for example. I bet you weren't expecting that. Life is full of unexpected things. I really like films with endings that I wasn't expecting. It's different from what I thought was going to happen. Maybe sometimes you have a present that you didn't know you were going to have. It's unexpected. Well, the Christmas story is full of unexpected things. And our first story is called An Unexpected Visitor. Try and imagine this scene while I'm explaining it to you. There's a young woman called Mary and she lives in a town called Nazareth. It's a very, very different place from Pontedawa, as you can see in the picture. Life was probably quite hard work for Mary, getting water, making food, travelling, um, just going to work. All of those things would have been hard, much harder for Mary than they are for us. And she was just a normal person. She um, lived in a normal house. She probably didn't have much money at all. And all the things that were hard for normal people would have been hard for Mary as well. And she just woke up one morning, one normal morning probably, and maybe made a little plan for that day. What shall I do today? What jobs shall I do today? But her day was going to take an unexpected turn because she had a very unexpected visitor. Now you all know who this visitor was don't you? It was the angel Gabriel from heaven and he was so amazing that Mary felt quite afraid. She'd never seen anything like it. It was totally unexpected and not only that but the angel gives her news doesn't he? He tells her that inside her there's a special baby growing a baby that God has put there. It's a miracle. And some more unexpected news that this baby is going to change the whole world. That he is going to be the saviour. The one to make us friends with God again. And that he's going to have a special name. His name is going to be Jesus. What unexpected news. And I'm sure after this that Mary's mind would be full of questions. What about this? What about that? How is this going to work? What about Joseph? 
are so many different questions. Every mummy who's having a baby has lots of questions. But well, what unexpected news and what unexpected feelings Mary must have had. But you know what? All of those amazing things were totally unexpected. But the most unexpected part of all is what Mary sings about in her song. Now, I'm not going to sing it to you, thank goodness. I'll read it out to you. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My heart says to God, You are wonderful. You are an amazing God. My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad. My soul is happy because of God, my saviour. She's happy at this news that God has sent a saviour. But listen to what else is totally unexpected for Mary. For he has remembered me, his lowly servant. Mary is amazed because this God has remembered her. This God knows her name, like we thought about in the last children's talk, the God who made the universe, the God who holds all, everything that's ever happened in history. Nothing of it was a surprise for him. The God who knows everything that's going to happen in the future. The God for whom nothing is unexpected. This God has remembered Mary. He knows Mary. He knows that what Mary needs most is a saviour and he loves Mary. And Mary says that this will always make her happy from now on to know that this day she learned that God knows her, that he remembers her and that he knows that she needs a saviour. And for all the amazing unexpected things about the Christmas story, this is really, really amazing, isn't it? That a God who is perfect, that a God who is powerful, remembers us, that he knows us, that he sees us, and that he comes and has given us Jesus to be our saviour. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all oh, the follies of sin, I resign. My grace. Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis Pardon 
Dawn is how I'm going to read from God's Word, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, through to chapter 5, verse 6. And after that, her husband, Alan, will pray. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters relating to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Since he himself is subject to weakness, this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And, all, and no one takes this honour on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he said in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we draw near to the end of a difficult year for many, was we ask you to bless and comfort all those who have been affected by this terrible virus, by your grace, we can also thank you for many things. We thank you for always being in control of all the events this year and guiding the hand of scientists in finding a vaccine. We thank you for all our wonderful, brave frontline workers who have worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic. We thank you for your gifts of creation that have enabled us to meet and stay in touch with people using internet technology. We thank you for our wonderful church, Mount Elim, helping us be the salt and light to the people of Pontetawe. We thank you for our fellowship together, being able to worship you and being able to offer each other support during this crisis. But we thank you most of all for sending us your Son, our Rescuer and our glorious Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who died for us on a cross after living a perfect life so that all who believe in him would have eternal life. He paid our debt in full for being sinners, a debt that we could never afford to repay. Help us therefore to love Jesus more and more each day and always be thankful for what he has done for us. Help us walk in his footsteps and glorify your name. You are the one true God. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone has a priest in their life, whether they realise it or not, whether they are religious or not, everyone has a priest. Why do I say this? It sounds a strange thing to say. How can everyone have a priest, especially non-religious people? Surely they haven't got a priest. Well, in today's passage, Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus is described as the great high priest. And look how his work is summarised in verse 16. As the one who gives mercy and grace in our time of need. The one who helps, the one who gives strength. And everyone is looking for this. The person or the thing or the experience that will give them a sense of peace and grace and mercy. You can see it this year in particular. It's been such a difficult year and people have been looking for peace. People have been looking for comfort. They found strength and solace in all sorts of different places. A community spirit, that network around them, people being able to support them, people that they can turn to. Being inspired by the sacrifice and by the work of frontline workers, these people who are willing to put themselves in the face and the way of danger for others. 
Perhaps it's been through church. People have been to church online. More people have listened to sermons and church services this year because of COVID than for many years. Now, what about other ways? Through retail therapy, through music, binge watching Netflix, perhaps. Some sort of escape, trying to find some sort of solution, some sort of help in this situation. And in our lives, people are looking for that. People are looking for strength, for peace, for comfort. And it's true of religions. You think of Eastern religions with transcendental meditation. Desire to find some sort of blissful state. A sense of the divine, a spiritual presence. Or the more organised religion, you think of Islam, Muhammad is Allah's messenger. He is some sort of mediator, he is some sort of priest who leads us to God and tells us God's will. I think of Catholic, Catholic religion with their relics and their veneration of the saints or Virgin Mary. And these are considered to be ways of being drawn into God's presence, that somehow we can draw on the grace and mercy of God through these. You can think of spiritual acts like meditation, chants and sacred music. God has created us with a God-shaped void. We've all been created in the image of God and there is this awareness of God. We know that God exists and so in times of trouble, in times of need, there is something within us that wants to know God, wants to reach out to God. We want some sort of transcendental experience. We want a spiritual experience. We want peace and comfort and joy. As the old adage goes, there are no atheists in the lifeboat that in in a crisis people turn to God. Well, Jesus is described as the great high priest. He is described as the one who truly leads us into God's presence. Two Tim, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus alone is the great high priest. He is unique. He is glorious. He is supreme. And this is the wonderful message of the Bible. This is the wonderful good news of Christianity, is that God the Father has sent his Son to be a priest, to be a mediator, to be someone who will give us grace and mercy and comfort and who will lead us into the presence of God. Do you want to know God's presence in your life? Do you want an experience of God? Do you want comfort and peace today, tomorrow and for all eternity? Well, Jesus is the one who gives us all of these things because he is the great high priest. He is the way, the truth and the life. What is it then that makes Jesus so excellent and glorious as a priest? Why is he described as the great high priest? Well, there are three things in today's passage that I want to concentrate on. The first one is this, that Jesus is excellent as the priest Because of where he is now, verse 14 tells us that Jesus has gone through the heavens. Now, Christmas will soon be upon us in a week or two. I want to take you back to Easter and to the Easter weekend and to Good Friday. What happened on that day as Jesus died on the cross? We can think about the reaction of the crowd We can think about the darkness over the land or Jesus' words. But remember that event in the temple, a symbolic event of the curtain that was between the rest of the temple and the most holy place being torn in two from top to bottom. It's one of the great symbolic events of Good Friday and the symbolism is clear. That the Lord Jesus has gone into the most holy place. That he has gone into the presence of God. And so now the obstacle between man and God has been torn down. And we can go into the presence of God. 
Remember in the Old Testament, you have the high priest who only once a year was able to go into the most holy place. And to, in order to go into the most holy place, all sorts of sacrifices were required. And once they were in the most holy place, they couldn't rest. They couldn't sit down and they couldn't stay there for a long time. They had to leave and only once a year they could go. There was something inadequate about it, something unfulfilling, because ultimately the sacrifices were not sufficient. It pointed forward to the need for a great and perfect sacrifice and a holy and righteous priest. Well, Jesus is the holy and righteous priest, and he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. And so as he died on the cross, he took our sins away. Earlier in the chapter, and we'll be thinking about this uh, in the new year, we'll go back to verses 12 to 13 uh, in January. It describes the Bible in this way. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing and soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before him to whom we must give an account. The scribes our sinfulness. If you look at our thoughts and our words and our deeds, and then if you look at the holiness of God as outlined and described in the Bible, you look at the laws and decrees and commandments of God and you see how perfect and holy are his laws and standards. And you look at the life of Jesus and see how perfect and pure and righteous he was. And you realise that we are sinners and all of this is revealed. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before God. And there's a time coming where we'll all have to give an account to God as judge and we will have to explain the way we've lived and as we are we stand guilty before God we stand condemned by nature as we are as we've lived our lives but what happened on the cross Jesus took our sin away he paid the penalty for our sins he appeased the wrath of God he removed the judgment and the condemnation so that everyone would believe in the Lord Jesus. Everyone who would trust in him can be forgiven of their sins fully and freely. And so there is now no obstacle. Our sin has been removed. God's wrath and condemnation has been removed. And there is no obstacle between us and God. We can come right into the presence of God. We can go into the most holy place. And even more remarkably, we can access God himself. You see, Jesus died on the cross. He was raised and ascended to heaven. He has gone through the curtain and into heaven itself. And this is where Jesus is. He is now seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so this is a promise and a guarantee that because the head has gone to heaven, the body will follow. Because our saviour, because of our brother, because he has gone to heaven, everyone who trusts in him will also be able to go to heaven one day. This is a wonderful comfort, and this is the true source of comfort, to know that we can access God today, and that we can pray to God and know that he hears us, to know that we have access to God because our saviour, our mediator, is in heaven. And he pleads our case and because he's died for us and taken our sins away. He can give us a relationship with God. Gives us a guarantee of heaven. If I were to tell you that there is an island thousands of miles away with exotic creatures and insects and with miles of golden beaches and with a coral reef along its edge, you would say, well, it sounds lovely, but how can you know? How can you know that there is such an island? Maybe it's make-believe, maybe it's not true. And what if someone were to return from that island with videos and photos? They'd been there. And so you would know that there is such a place as Australia, a real place, because people have been there and they've turned from there. We know that 
heaven exists. We know that there is somewhere on the other side, if you like. Because Jesus came to this world from heaven. He was sent by God the Father to be the saviour of this world. He came to this world and he has now returned to heaven. He has gone through the heavens and has returned to the glory which he had before. And he's in the presence of God the Father. And so we believe that heaven exists because the Bible tells us so. And because Jesus himself has been there and he has returned to heaven. And this is where he is now. He has conquered the grave. He has defeated death and he is in heaven itself. And so he can draw us into God's presence. He can give us access to his father. No one, no, um, he is the way, the truth and life. No one comes to father except through him. But through Jesus, we can turn to God in prayer. And because he's in heaven, he can now send forth a blessing upon us. He can send the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our counsellor. He can give us comfort. He can give us peace in our time of need. You think of the way the Holy Spirit gives us a peace that the world cannot even begin to imagine or give. How the Holy Spirit can give us a new understanding of God's grace and comfort. Give us a new vision of the Lord Jesus. Remind us of the glory of the gospel how privileged and how blessed we are and the holy spirit draws near to us has been he's been sent by god the father and so we remember that this priest is in heaven now he is alive our comfort is not found in this life only we don't find our comfort in human ideas or philosophies we don't find our ultimate comfort in material blessings those things are fleeting those things are temporary they are unreliable because they are either human or they are of this world but our great high priest is in heaven now he is alive and he knows us by name he knows his his sheep and so he can bless us and comfort us the second way jesus is excellent as the great high priest is because of where he's been verse 15 we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. This takes us, of course, to the Christmas message and to the wonder of the incarnation, that the Son of God should take on human flesh, that God should become man and live and dwell amongst us here in this world. He came to save us. He came to die on the cross, ultimately, to take our sins away, as we've seen, to give us peace with God. But he also came so that he could sympathise with us. Now, God is all-knowing and he is almighty. He can do all things. He can sympathise. He can empathise. But actually, he's gone that extra step in sending his son to this world in the fact that his son has lived and existed here in this world, he can sympathise with us through his experience. He has walked where we've walked. He has felt what we've felt. He's experienced what we've experienced. He endured the attacks of the devil day in, day out. He knows what it is to be tempted in every way. You think of every category of temptation, and he was tempted in those ways. He would have been tempted to become selfish, to live for his own glory and comfort. He is the Son of God. Think of the glory he had previously. He could have demanded worship in this life and to be served rather than to serve. He could have chosen the path of comfort and wealth and adoration. He could have been loved by everyone in this life. He would have been tempted to become bitter and to become incredibly judgmental towards others as he heard people criticise him and mock him and as he saw the sneering and the scoffing of the people around. How easy it would have been to have been bitter, to harbour grudges against people. He could have become proud and vindictive to see such sinfulness, to see those attitudes, 
He could have had an air of pride about him and superiority. Look at me, look how better, much better I am. Look how foolish and sinful you are. And he could have been patronising, he could have degraded people and undermined them on every opportunity. He had so much power physically, intellectually, spiritually, he had so much power. He could have used this to belittle others. And so the temptation was there all the time and all the various physical and fleshly temptations he saw the world around he saw the, the the world and the ways of the devil and he would have been tempted just as we are and he was tried he was challenged he was lonely he was isolated he was rejected by his loved ones he was betrayed by those closest to him he saw physical suffering he saw his loved ones dying he was tempted, he was tried in, tried in every way. And so he can sympathise with us. We have a saviour, we have a priest who knows what we're going through. There's a film called Gran Torino, uh, directed by Clint, e Clint Eastwood, and it stars Clint Eastwood. And uh, in that film, Clint Eastwood acts and, as a um, grizzled old man who's experienced everything in life. He's hardened, he's cynical, he questions everything. His family have given up on him because of his attitude, because he's so belligerent towards everyone. And halfway through the film, a priest comes to his house and knocks on the door, wants to help him, wants to comfort him. He knows that he is struggling. And Clint Eastwood's character, Clint Eastwood's character looks upon him and he's filled with disdain. How can you help me? You're a baby, you're a child. What do you know about life? What have you experienced? How can you help me? And perhaps we have felt like that, that we can't truly sympathise with people, that we haven't really experienced what they have experienced. Yes, we try to sympathise. Yes, we try to empathise. We try to put ourselves in other people's shoes as much as we can. And yet sometimes we just haven't got the imagination. We can't quite empathise with people enough. Where the Lord Jesus doesn't have that problem. He is able to sympathise with us fully because he has been tempted and he's been tried in every way, yet without sin. That's the key distinction, of course. He did not sin in any of this. And so, in a sense, he understands it more fully because he was tempted to the at the most extreme. We give in to temptation, but he said no again and again, and so he full felt the full force and, and the power of temptation. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and so he can sympathise with us fully. See, when we come before God in prayer, we come before a God who knows and understands what we're going through. Do you feel some of those things that I've experienced already, I've mentioned already? Are you experiencing loneliness or grief or isolation? Are you being tempted in a variety of ways? Well, come before God. We have a Father in heaven who understands because his Son has been where we have been. And we have a priest and a mediator who understands what we are going through. And so he's able to help us as one who's been there himself. He mourns with us. He weeps with us. He fights and battles with us. And so he's able to comfort us in our time of need. It is a blessing, isn't it? When you've got a problem and you turn to someone who's been exactly where you've been. They know what to say. They know what to do. Do they know what to give you? Well, how a great high priest, Lord Jesus, knows exactly what to give us and how and when to give it to us because he has been exactly where we are. And the third reason why Jesus is excellent as the great high priest is because he is God's choice as priest. He is God's choice. Do you want a relationship with God? Do you want God's peace and comfort? Do you want an experience of God? Then look to the one God the Father himself has appointed. Don't look to someone who's appointed themselves. Don't look to someone created or something created by people. Don't look to human ideas or earthly material things. Look to the Saviour. Look to the priest, the one provided by God the Father. 
in chapter 5, verses 4 to 6, he says that no one can take this honour of being a priest upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron and the Levitical priests were called by God. So Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever. All other human priests, whether it is physical or whether it is material, all the blessings and the comforts that we find in this life are limited. They are created beings. They are finite. They are limited. They are fleeting. They are unreliable. They are appointed by people or they've been created in this world. But the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who is sent by God the Father. He is the Messiah. He is the priest appointed by God. And so he truly is able to help us as God's servant. He is his choice. If you want to access a king or a queen, well, where do you go? Well, you turn to the son or the daughter, not a random person on the street. Don't turn to me if you want to go to Buckingham Palace. Go to somehow send a letter to a, a royal figure, a member of the royal family, and they will be able to give you access to the king or the queen. If you want to know God, if you want to access God, then look to the one sent by God himself. So do you see how Jesus is the perfect and great high priest? Because of where he is now, he is alive. We have a, a, a priest, we have a saviour who is in glory today. He is raised from the dead, he's been ascended to heaven and he continues to be alive. And so from heaven he can give us access to his father, he can give us access to God himself. And he can send us the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to give us peace. We think of where he has been, he has lived in this world he has been where you've been. He's experienced what you are experiencing. And so he can truly sympathise with us. The Son of God became fully man and experienced everything and yet without sin. And so he understands and we can turn to God in prayer and pour out all of our requests before him. And he is God's choice, not man's choice, not a limited or finite choice but he's the one sent by god the father to be your priest and mediator and so what is the author's conclusion well verse 16 let us then approach a throne of god a throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need let us approach with confidence over the last few weeks the boys looking forward to christmas of course have been making their requests known they want certain traditions to continue at Christmas, despite of COVID. They want particular gifts, and they haven't been quiet. They haven't been reserved about it. They've come and they've told us exactly what they want for Christmas, because they are our children and they know that we are their parents and we want to love them and give them gifts and so on at Christmas. Let us not be timid or reserved about coming before God in prayer. If you've repented of your sins, if you've confessed of them and asked God for forgiveness, if you've trusted in Jesus' death on the cross for your forgiveness, if you've asked for eternal salvation by the Lord Jesus, you know that you are a child of God and so you can come before God with total confidence. And you turn to the throne of grace. And everything is in that expression, the throne. And so it symbolises power and authority. God is able to help us. And it's a throne of grace. He has compassion and love. And so he wants to help us as well. God welcomes us to come before him in prayer. He hears us. He wants us to turn to him. Are you aware of guilt, of sin? Are you aware of difficulties because of your faith? People may be harassing you or giving you a difficult time because of your faith. Anxiety or worry, poverty, fear about the future, fear about what will happen because of COVID, trials, temptations, 
loneliness, rejection, bereavement, all of these human experiences. Are you going through any of them at the moment? Or whatever you are going through, you know that you have a great high priest through whom you have access to God the Father and the throne of grace. He will give you faith to persevere, boldness to stand against temptation. He'll give you peace instead of fear and anxiety, joy in the darkness patience in illness and hope in grief. He will help us in our time of need and this is the hope of the Christian. Turn to him this week. Where do children go when they are in need? They go to mum and they go to dad. They know that they will find comfort there. Where does a husband or a wife go where they go to their spouse? Or they go maybe in later years to their children, knowing that they will find support and help. Well, where does the Christian go in time of need? To the throne of grace, through the Lord Jesus. Are you aware of struggles and trials and temptations? Then take it all to the Lord in prayer. For your blessing and for God's glory. Amen.
Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that we can come with confidence before the throne of grace. Thank you that you are the King. Thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you that you are on your throne. And thank you that you are a compassionate Lord. Thank you that you are loving and merciful. And so we come before you with confidence, knowing that we are received in the name of the Lord Jesus, knowing that we have peace with you through his blood. Help us day by day to know the privilege and the blessing of prayer. And would we make our many requests known to you? Would you come before you as our Heavenly Father and help us to worship you and praise you because you are worthy. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and evermore. Amen.